Hi, I'm Lady Genevieve, and if you are not new here, then you know that Steven Spielberg's West Side Story has been one of my most anticipated films since last year. It was going to be one of my big juggernauts of 2020 before everything happened in the world and the cinemas were shut down. If you are new here, I will quickly catch you up. On the journey to this film being released, I made two video essays about West Side Story. One was talking about some of the broader themes of the source material, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, and how they translated that material into the musical adaptation, the 1961 feature film adaptation, as well as Boz Lerman's adaptation. I followed up on that video with one that honed in on more of the themes from West Side Story to do with the police and the secondary character of anybody's. I'll be sure to link those videos up in the card so you can watch them if you haven't already done so, along with an interview that I did with Ilda Mason, who is one of the actresses from Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. Now that I've finally seen Steven Spielberg's West Side Story, on the opening weekend of course, I'm here to share some thoughts about this new adaptation. And if all you want to know is whether or not I recommend that you watch it, yes, of course, go watch it. I am going to be talking about spoilers in this review, so proceed at your own discretion. Obviously, this story is one that's already been out for decades or centuries, depending on which source material you're referencing. So the vast majority of people that go see this film will probably already be familiar with the main plot points of the story. But there are things about this adaptation that are different from the 1961 film. So if you don't want those things to be spoiled, I've given the film my recommendation and you can just come back after you've watched it. I have a tendency to get long-winded and tangential, so I'm really going to try to condense a lot of my feedback. If you want to ask me any questions about more specific topics, I can elaborate in the comment section. There were many things I liked about the film, but I also had some issues with it. I think a lot of the issues I had stem from the fact that Romeo and Juliet is my favorite Shakespearean play, and I grew up watching and re-watching many of the film adaptations, including West Side Story, and I was also really into different musical films from the golden age of Hollywood musicals. My point is, I don't think the nitpicks that I had with certain details of this film are things that the majority of the moviegoing masses will care about. But it's my channel, my opinions, so let's get into it. We can start with the opening number. It was a bit of a jarring start because the editing and the cinematography in general was so kinetic that I felt like I was being thrust into the action when, to be honest, I would have preferred more of a slow burn so that I could get introduced to this new world and the main ensemble of characters and the rival gangs instead of just being flung into it. I don't want to go so far as to say they should have just recreated the 1961 opening number, but there's no denying that that opening is a lot to live up to. I'm not opposed to the new West Side Story trying to make the story its own. It was a little surprising though, considering that Bernardo was introduced really late in the number. He doesn't even come in until right at the end of it. And I would have loved to see him in particular being part of that big opening number and be part of the dancing. David was a good Bernardo though. He had charisma and I would like to see him book more films after this. Anytime he was with Anita, I had a great time. Truly, Ariana DeBose is the standout of this film. And maybe I'm just biased because I tend to show favoritism for Anita as a character. But even so, anytime Ariana was on screen, I could not keep my eyes off her. If these Hollywood casting directors don't start putting her on their rotations and sending her information out into the world so she can have more opportunities, all will be lost. I want to circle back around to the topic of the musical numbers. I have mixed feedback about this topic. Whenever it was a musical number that was largely about having the characters just stand and sing or walk and sing, I really liked them. Steven and Yanuj were great at capturing and showcasing the performers that were emoting these songs. 
for example, there was this one shot during the Maria song where Tony is standing in a puddle and it looked so good that it blew my mind. Disney, if you want me to buy a DVD of West Side Story 2021, there had better be a making of featurette for the puddle shot or else I don't want it. However, whenever it was a big musical number with a large ensemble of dancers doing rigorous dance choreography, I had some issues. There were not enough wide shots for me and there were too many cuts. I wanted to see the large ensemble of dancers all doing their choreography. That is what is exciting to watch in a number like that. Dancers doing incredible things with their bodies is what makes the number visually interesting. If you watch a lot of old Hollywood musicals, the takes were much longer with far less cuts. I know some people were skeptical about Steven Spielberg doing a musical, and I always thought that that was an unfair judgment to make when they had not even seen the film yet. And it seemed very dismissive of how incredible of a director Steven Spielberg is. This was the only part of the film where I disagreed with the choice that he made as a director of the film. The 1961 film was a lot better about this because they had Jerome Robbins, who is actually credited on this new film, by the way, because he was one of the original creators of West Side Story as a stage musical, and among other responsibilities, he choreographed it. He was fired from the 1961 film during production because he got them really behind schedule with how much of a perfectionist he was about the dance numbers. But the other director, Robert Wise, agreed that Jerome should still have a co-directing credit on the film. After Jerome was fired, his assistants stayed on the film to help Robert Wise with the musical numbers, and it completely shows in the final result. If you're going to have a big dance number, you need to let the audience see the dancing more wide shots, longer takes, please and thank you. Also, if this wasn't obvious, I am still firmly of the belief that Steven Spielberg is a brilliant director and an absolute legend. Stream Minority Report. I'm only nitpicking because I'm very opinionated about musical films and technical details that a lot of other people won't care about in regards to what's in them. One of the things I really loved about Steven Spielberg's West Side Story was how much more attention was put on the character Anybody's. They didn't have to tiptoe as much around Anybody's because the code is not a thing anymore. And that fight sequence of Anybody's beating up all of the jets and all of the police officers, I'm just saying, where is my Anybody's action film? I'm waiting. There were some things done to this script that I had a whole array of reactions to. Maria gets a bit more material so she can showcase more of her opinions, her desires, and her general agency. That was all perfectly fine with me. It gave Rachel more to do as an actress, all of which I enjoyed watching. But they also made some shifts to Tony's story insofar as he has this new backstory of having already been to prison, and the reason he was sent there was because he was convicted of almost killing a rival gang member in a prior rumble. I can sort of see what they were trying to do by implementing this change, they were trying something different, but it took me a while to figure out what exactly it was that they were doing, and maybe, or probably, I'm a bit too attached to the play because I cannot deny that I prefer a more doe-eyed interpretation of Romeo. If you take the Zeffirelli film, for example, the first time they show Romeo, he's just walking up the road towards his friends, and then he smiles, and it's just this really sweet innocence. It's simple, but it's effective in conveying who this character is. Romeo and Juliet are just these kids who think that knowing someone for all of five seconds is enough to say that you are in love with them and that feeling that love is enough to just magically fix massive socio-political problems and the worst kind of deeply indoctrinated tribalism. They're incredibly naive but they are sweet with each other which is why you are so devastated when they become the final casualties of this massive conflict between the Capulets and the Montagues. I feel mixed about changing this version of Romeo, Tony, 
to a character who is already part of that violent tribalism at the beginning of the story. Tony's first scene in the film has him brooding like he's trying to be Stanley Kowalski, which is a peculiar choice for me because I felt like you were already setting a weird tone between him and Riff. I feel like you need to have that sweet brotherly affection between them so that we can understand why he lashes out the way that he does after Bernardo kills Riff. Tony actually fights Bernardo in this movie, which again was an interesting choice because then in a way for me it felt like Tony killing Bernardo was more about his personal battle with his inner darkness than it was about him lashing out because he lost his best friend. This version of Tony worked best for me when he was just being a foolish boy naively infatuated with a pretty girl that he met at a dance. They think they're in love after meeting for a couple of minutes. This boy asked her to run away with him after they had spent maybe a total of five minutes in each other's company. That's when I knew. Ah, there he is. There's that signature Romeo naivete. What I really love about Romeo and Juliet is how incredibly insightful it is about that hateful bigotry and how poisonous it is and how it spreads. Violence begets more violence. The changes to Tony's material were what they were, but much to my surprise, they actually ended up effectively showing that type of transformation with Chino's character. He starts off as this pretty meek, harmless boy. He even has this moment with Tony where they help each other to get into the building where the rumble is happening, and there is no animosity between them. But once the violence breaks out in the rumble and Riff is killed and then Bernardo is killed, it's too late. Chino gets corrupted and poisoned. In a way, it kind of feels like Ju-on, the Japanese horror film, in the sense that you have this violence that infects people and when people die, these violent deaths, it proceeds to spread to other people who become consumed by it. The other reason why, the more I think about it, I'm not fond of the script changes to Tony as a character is that it makes the character fall into this trap of spreading that archaic and incorrect narrative that the love of a woman will be what fixes violent men. No! The word you're looking for is therapy. Another issue I had with the script was the choice to make the Jet Girls in the blink of an eye do this 180 from being threatening racists against Anita to all of a sudden trying to defend her because the Jets are wanting to assault her. Do you know anything about history? Or even more recently, did you see the statistics of the ethnic demographics for the voting results in the 2016 US election? All I'm saying is it wasn't realistic. That's the most polite way I can explain it. Jumping back to some positive feedback, I love that museum location they had Tony and Maria visit for their first date. It was invoking the Romeo and Juliet aesthetic. It was giving me fair Verona vibes and I was here for it. Whatever location scout found that spot had better get a raise pay your workers. Also, I really liked the scripting choice to have Tony trying to learn Spanish for Maria. Really excellent creative choice. And overall, like I've said, I liked the film. I cried while watching it. It took me a while to get into it. I had to adjust to certain changes that they were making. But once the momentum got going in maybe around the middle of the movie, for me, I just I was feeling the fantasy, I was feeling the spirit of Romeo and Juliet, and then I started crying. Regardless of my nitpicking as an insufferable Romeo and Juliet stan, I do hope that people will go watch the film. I'm glad that Steven Spielberg was able to live his dream at 74 years young. Actually, his birthday is coming up soon. He's going to be 75. He is out here fulfilling a lifelong dream of getting to tell 
West Side Story. And I love that for him. I also love that lots of new talent that are Latin American and Caribbean are getting opportunities to be in a big Steven Spielberg movie. And perhaps, hopefully, that will lead them to further opportunities in their respective careers. I didn't share all of my feedback about the film because when I was writing up my notes, I could feel how quickly my pedantic side was escalating and I just don't think anyone wants to hear it. So I figured alternating back and forth between the really good things in the film and the things that I was more critical of would be the better way to go. Oh, and another thing that I really liked, Riff as a character was very well done. The actor, Mike, seemed to be going a bit transatlantic with his accent and I enjoyed that. Transatlantic accents are so nostalgic in the best way. It's so classically old Hollywood. Really fun for me to watch. Let me know what you thought of West Side Story 2021 if you've seen it and stay tuned because I actually have another mini video essay idea that I've been brainstorming that's related to West Side Story and includes this new feature film adaptation. If ever there was a time to make it, it would be this month, hopefully. I don't know how long it'll take me to finish making, but I think that's next on the to-do list in between working on the last few Dickinson review videos that I have to make. See you in the next video. Bye.